Hello everybody, this is the pre-calculus lesson and it is for section 2-5 day 2. Um, we had spent almost all of 2-5 day 1 just looking at how do you get the linear factorization um, and, and if you have the linear factorization, how do you write those polynomials? And the bulk of it, almost exclusively, was us writing those polynomials. So we need to switch it up and we need to go back to saying, okay, how does this all fit together with the zeros? Because our objective is um, using the fundamental theorem of algebra, using the linear factorization theorem, finding complex conjugate zeros, and then factors with real coefficients. And so it, it kind of opens it up to how do we find them all? And this example says we're going to be factoring a polynomial and we're going to see some complex zeros. So find all the zeros of f of x equals x to the fifth minus 3x to the fourth minus 5x to the third plus 5x squared minus 6x plus 8. <gasps> Deep breath because that was a long one. And then write f of x in its linear factorization. So I see something like this, and I'm seeing that it's a degree 5, which means I'm going to have to find at least one. I might have, if, I, if I can find one zero, then I'm down to four. Maybe I'll be able to factor it if I can get it down to four. Um, but we'll just have to see. At the very least, I need the one. If I can get three, then I can get this down to a quadratic, and I can find the rest of them. So my possibles. All the factors of 8 as my numerator. And then in the front, we have a 1. So we should expect that we will see positive and negative 1, 2, 4, and 8. Any of those are our possible rational zeros. Now, so far, up to this point, we haven't had a lot to look at with that, and that's because the graphing calculator will give us the zeros. But if we get to larger numbers and we know that we're not seeing what we need to see with our little negative 10 to 10 window, then this becomes really important because it, it tells us, okay, now go look for the ones that you couldn't see from negative 10 to 10. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the calculator and, and we're going to narrow down our search. We're not going to do synthetic two, four, six, eight times. We're, we're going to narrow down the search. So let's graph this one. And there it is. And I have it activated. So take a second and put that monster in. x to the fifth minus 3x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 5x squared, minus 6x plus 8. Because I saw that all my possibles uh, were listed anywhere from um, positive and negative 1 up to that positive and negative 8, I know that I should be seeing all of the possibles. And here's what I see. I see three zeros. And this was a fifth degree polynomial. So it's very possible, in fact, very, very possible, there are going to be two imaginary zeros with this. So what I want to do is figure out what should I try here, what looks good. And it kind of looks like negative 2, 1, and 4. So I'm just going to go to the table. I'm not going to ask Blinky to help me out with this. And I see negative 2 is a 0, 1 is a 0, and 4 is a 0 all about the y being 0, because that's where our x-intercepts are going to be at. So I'm going to use that information Okay, the smart board was being a little funky there. So um, now what I want to do is write down those zeros that I saw in the table, negative 2, 1, and 4. And I'm just going to put GC by this telling whoever it is that looks at my paper. I used a graphing calculator to get those as possibles. We might have punched something in wrong, so we have to verify them. That's one reason that we have to verify them. The other is we have to work this down to that quadratic so we can solve and get the last two zeros, which we know are imaginary because they didn't show up. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, they're all there. And we'll just start number line, negative 2 first. 
So go ahead and do your synthetic. And take a peek. Do your synthetic again, since you had a remainder of zero, which means, hey, it works. So, so far we've verified negative two and one, and I need to verify that four is going to work. So take a peek, see if yours matches up with this, and then let's see what we have left. And remember, you can pause this at any time if you need more time to finish something up. Well, of course, our last two zeros are going to be imaginary because we would subtract one from both sides and take the square root. And whenever we take the square root, we write the plus or minus down, and the square root of negative 1 is i. So we verified synthetically that our three zeros that we saw with the graphing calculator, negative 2, 1, and 4, were in fact zeros of this polynomial function. And then we used the remaining last line of data from the synthetic to figure out those last two imaginaries. Now, do we have to write them as zeros? What do we have to do with them? So we go back up to the instructions, find all the zeros. Did that. We have those. But once you find all the zeros, write it in its linear factorization. Okay, so that means we have to think what would each of these parentheses be? Well, for minus 2, it would be x plus 2 because remember, these all came out of that x minus a as a factor. And then for 1, it will be x minus 1. And then for 4, x minus 4. And for our plus and minus i, we'll have x minus i and x plus i. So there is its linear factorization. And yes, we did find the zeros. And we did it algebraically because synthetic division is algebraic. And then that, the piece that, that we have to get the imaginaries is, is going to be algebra-based, of course, as well. Now, the reason I say, and my little sigh there, was because we don't necessarily want to do synthetic with i, and we wouldn't have had any idea that it was just one i that was going to be our, uh, our remaining zeros, our plus or minus i piece there. So we had to do algebra to get those. And again, basically, you want to get it down to a quadratic and then show that you can factor it or show that you can solve it from there with completing the square. So our final answer here is the linear factorization. Um, some people would probably worry, OK, but I didn't write down all of my zeros nicely. That's really not what the main objective of this problem was. The main objective was to get the linear factorization. So finding the zeros was something we had to do to get there. So in this case, the negative 2, the 1, the 4, and the plus or minus i, uh, they're not answers. They are steps to getting your answer. And so we don't have to formally write down that those were the zeros because I can see that you tested those with synthetic and or used algebra to solve them. Now, this has some extra practice in here. And some of these are pretty basic. And what tends to happen at the pre-calc level is sometimes you overthink because you're like, my gosh, we just did something so much harder than this. You know, I, I'm going to, don't I have to have a, a, a tougher pattern here or something that's a little bit um, complicated? And the answer is no. I mean, we still go back to factoring first. If we can factor, that's what we want to do. So in number one, it says find all the zeros for the functions. And I notice it's already factored. So in order for this to be a zero, let's take a step back. We should write zero equals x times the quantity x plus 5 squared to show that we understand the concept of finding the zeros. But if x is zero, 
then this entire product will be zero. And if x is negative 5, then the entire product will be zero. But what we want to do now is think of these in the way that we want to write them. And what we're finding here are zeros. It did not ask us about intercepts. So it would be best to write it as f of 0 equals 0, f of negative 5 equals 0. And then that f of 0 equals 0, well, it was only there once. And if it's there once, we tend not to talk about multiplicity. But just because, again, I'm going to do baby steps here, we could put multiplicity 1. And that means when we graph this, the graph will actually cross the x-axis at 0 because 1 is an odd number. But for the negative 5, we have a multiplicity of 2. And that means that the graph is not going to cross at negative 5. It's going to be tangent to it. So it's going to hit it, and then it's going to head back in the direction from which it came. So that multiplicity piece, that's huge. You know, we have to remember that that's supposed to put the picture in our mind of what this would be. So this is a cubic, and it's a cubic that's going to cross at 0, and it's going to bounce at negative 5. And with that, we can get a picture in our head pretty quick of what that's going to look like for a graph. For number 2, f of x equals x squared minus 5x plus 6. And so they've taken the factoring away from us, and we need to do that. And again, we're finding the zeros, so we need to put 0 equals. And we need to go through that step of, is there a greatest common monomial factor? There's not. We need to look for perfect squares. This is not a perfect square trinomial because there's a 6 in the back, which is not a perfect square. So we just need two numbers that multiply to 6 and add to negative 5. And that's going to be negative 2 and negative 3. So the zeros are at 2 and 3. And again, we're talking zeros, so f of 2 equals 0, f of 3 equals 0. And for both of these, these are first power factors, which are multiplicity of 1. So this parabola, those are odd multiplicities. It's going to cross the x-axis at 2 and at 3. Down to number 3. Let me scroll it up just a bit because when I do this way with the videos, there's no blind spot. So f of x equals x squared plus 4. I need a 0. We always try factoring first. Greatest common monomial factor? No. Perfect squares? Yes, but there's only two terms. And the only way we could factor that is if it was the difference of two squares. And there's a plus there, not a minus. So that means we're just going to solve this one. We're going to subtract 4 from both sides take the square root, and then realize, oh, of course I couldn't factor this. This is imaginary. Positive and negative 2i. And that's because the square root of 4 is square root of negative 4 will be the square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1, which is 2i. Probably didn't need that, but again, I'm trying to do baby steps here so everybody can see everything. So, zeros of negative 2i, positive 2i. But I'm not going to talk about multiplicity with this because those are imaginary. They're not really going to cross. So we leave it at that. Here are the two zeros. Number 4, f of x equals x to the fifth minus x. We need a 0. And then we'll start factoring. And this one happens to have a greatest common monomial factor, and that's x. So we take the x out first. Then we look for special patterns. So I'm looking at perfect squares. Oh, yeah. x squared, if you square it, is x to the fourth. And 1 squared, if you square it, is 1. So that'll factor to x squared plus 1 times x squared minus 1. Hey, wait a minute. This is like a never-ending factoring problem, because I can factor x squared minus 1. That's x plus 1 and x minus 1. Well, there it is. Because again, x squared plus 1, it's not factorable. We don't know two numbers that multiply to 1 and add to 0. So that's not going to be factorable. We'll have to solve. 
There's our first zero. Let's do the easy ones first. Second, third, but x squared plus 1, we'll set it equal to 0, subtract 1 from both sides, take the square root, and I'm going to need more space. Square root of negative 1 is i, so we get our plus or minus i. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros, and that's what we were supposed to have because this is a degree 5 polynomial. All right, so let's write these down. f of 0 equals 0. f of negative 1 equals 0. f of 1 equals 0. And then f of negative i equals 0. And f of i equals 0. Now I put that in a different column because those are imaginary. We're not going to check whether or not they cross or not. But for 0, negative 1, and 1, it's important that I go back and see that those are all first powers. So this will be uh, an x to the fifth, a degree 5 polynomial. Going to look kind of like a cubic, and the end behavior will anyway. And it will cross at 0, negative 1, and 1. And then it has the two imaginary zeros. So factoring first, that's always what we go after, factoring. Number five, f of x equals x to the third plus 6x squared minus 2x. Degree three polynomial, going to have three zeros. All right, first thing we notice when we set it equal to zero is that we are writing down a lot of x's. That means we have a greatest common monomial factor of x. And then our hope would be that we can keep factoring. So x squared plus 6x minus 2. They're not perfect squares. It's not a perfect square trinomial. Negative 2 is not a perfect square. Um, two numbers that multiply to negative 2 and add to 6. We're not going to find integers that do that. So we have a 0 with our x in front. But we're going to have to complete the square in order to see the other two zeros. So we're going to add 2 to both sides. And then we'll do our little b over 2. So 6 over 2 is 3 squared, and that's 9. So now we have a perfect square trinomial, and it's going to be equal to 11. And that would be x plus 3, the quantity squared, because we just squared 3 to get that. Now we'll take the square root of each side. x plus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 11. And then we'll subtract 3. Now we can't simplify the square root of 11. There are no perfect squares that are going to divide into that evenly. But it's important for us to note, hey, we found three zeros. You know, we had 0 earlier, and then we had the negative 3 plus the square root of 11 and negative 3 minus the square root of 11. They would not be nice fractions because the square root of 11 is rational. But f of 0 equals 0. f of negative 3 minus the square root of 11 equals 0 f of negative 3 plus the square root of 11 equals 0. And then each of these would only occur once. And we have our little power of 1 up here. Let me put that in red so that can be seen as different up there. So there's a power of 1. And then the other was an x squared, and we got our two zeros out of that. But each of these is at a multiplicity of 1. So this graph would actually cross at all three of those zeros. Number six. All right, f of x equals x to the third plus 10x squared plus 33x plus 34 degree three polynomial. And I'm going to put a zero in here and start to think about how does somebody factor this monster? Well, let's see. There's no greatest common monomial factor. Um, we could try factoring by grouping. So I'd have to group these two together and these two together. And that would give me x squared times x plus 10. Oh, my goodness. I wouldn't be able to pull anything but a 1 out of the back of this. And of course, 
we see that the two factors here, they're not the same. So it's not factorable by grouping. So we go back. And on a test, you'd probably just leave that for me anyway so that I could see you at least knew to try the factoring by grouping. But we realize that um, this is going to be one where we're going to need the calculator's help. We need a zero. You know, if we can't factor it, we have to find a zero another way. So a list of possibles. 34. 1, 2, not 3, not 4, not 5, not 6, not 7, not 8 not 9, not 10. So we realize we've got 1 and 2 and 17 and 34. And then we have a 1 in the front here. Now, this is what I was talking about before when I said the possibles tell us, hey, if you haven't seen what you need from negative 10 to 10, in this case in particular, we might have to go to 17 or 34 to see our zero. We only need one, but at least we have something in mind as we start doing our graphing. So back to the graphing calculator. I'll turn that one off and turn this one on. Zoom six. Now I see one. Again, I don't know, is it going to curl back? Is it going to go up there? And my worry is, I could go as far as negative 34 and 34 for this one for zeros. So for my window, I probably better try like negative 40 to 40. Just to make sure. Nope, that was the only one. So back to zoom six. It looks like negative two. Let's check the table. Second graph, and it is. Negative two is the zero that we can see. Now, since it didn't cross anywhere else, I know that I'm going to get a pair of imaginaries for the rest of this. But this is my starting place. So I need to take that negative 2 and divide synthetically and make sure I get a 0 for the remainder. And third, second, first, and 0 power, they are in order. They're in standard form. And go ahead and do your synthetic with negative 2. And we have 1, 8, 17, and 0. Woohoo! So now we write what we have left. And we know they're imaginary. So I'm not even going to try and factor this. I mean, you could waste your time for a minute or two thinking about it, but I'm not going to waste my time with it. I, I know they're imaginary. I'm going to have to complete the square. So I'll move the 17 over, subtract 17 from both sides, do my little b over 2. 8 over 2 squared is 4 squared, which is 16. And of course, negative 17 plus 16 gives us negative 1. And we realize, yeah, this is going to be imaginary. So this was x plus 4, the quantity squared, because we just got done saying that we had to square a 4 when we did b over 2 squared. Take the square root of both sides. Don't forget your plus or minus when you physically write that down. So plus or minus i. And then subtract 4 from both sides. And there's our two imaginaries. Negative 4 plus i and negative 4 minus i. So f of negative 2 was equal to 0. And f of negative 4 minus i equals 0. And f of negative 4 plus i equals 0. But for multiplicity, we only need to talk about the negative 2, which was there to the first power because the imaginary zeros do not actually cross. So our multiplicity of 1 on our negative 2, again, we normally wouldn't even write down that that has multiplicity. You have to have a degree of 2 or higher to be considered multiple zeros. But 
baby steps. So everybody, when they look at the notes, can see, yeah, we did talk about all of that. The multiplicity was a one. Next up, f of x equals x to the fourth plus 29 x squared plus 100. All right, well, it's a degree four. And I need a zero. All right, so let's see. Greatest common monomial factor? Nope. Perfect square trinomial? Maybe. This is x squared, squared, and this is 10 squared. So if we multiply those together and double it, do we get 29? Well, x squared times 10 is 10x squared, and if you double that, you get 20x squared. It's not a perfect square trinomial, but at least we checked. All right. So then we're down to good old-fashioned factoring, but it's going to need to have an x squared in the front of each one of those because x squared times x squared would give us x to the fourth. And then I need to come up with two numbers that multiply to 100 and add to 29, 25 and 4. Now, I can't keep factoring with those because that's the sum of two squares, and there's no such thing as a sum of two squares formula. So I have to set these equal to zero and solve. So I subtract 25 from both sides, take the square root, and so this will be plus or minus the square root of 25 times the square root of negative 1, which is plus or minus 5 I. So this is just a reminder step, a baby step. Um, if you can skip that step, do so. You know, you don't need to have that step shown. Then subtracting 4 from both sides and taking the square root, x equals plus or minus the square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1, which is plus or minus 2i. Same thing here. Baby step, reminder step about working with imaginaries last year. And then f of negative 5i equals 0. f of positive 5i equals 0. f of negative 2i equals 0. And f of positive 2i equals 0. But because those are all imaginary zeros, we don't do the multiplicity because they are not really going to cross. They are all imaginary. All right. Now, <laughs> it's always kind of funny to see where we thought the first year we taught this, hey, this is where day two would start. Now, normally we do get a little bit farther because um, they're cutting down our times here to be with you. So we've got 50 minutes versus a little over 50 from before. But um, that's why this is three days instead of two. So it says the warm up here is to find all the zeros for these, which is exactly what we've been doing. So we've got a degree three polynomial. We're looking for three of the zeros. And we set it equal to zero. And we look for a greatest common monomial factor. But there isn't anything. There's nothing I can pull out of all of those. So the next thing we would do is fa try factoring by grouping. So let me rewrite this here. And I think pretty quickly you realize, no, this isn't going to work. Pull an x squared out and get x plus 11. And uh, 1, I can pull a 1 out of the back. Those factors are not the same. Doesn't work. But again, a strike through that shows me, hey, at least you tried. You know, you knew to try. So we'd write down the possibles. And in the back here, we have a 29, which doesn't give us much, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 29. And in the front, we have a 1. But what it does tell us is, we might have to make our window go out to 29 for the x's in order to see a 0. Now, what I'm really looking for, since this is a cubic, is just one real 0. You know, that's what I'm looking for. And it has to cross somewhere. So, and why would I say that? Because it's a cubic. And a cubic, the end behaviors are opposite. So at some point, 
it has to cross. It just has to. All right, so I'll try zoom six with this one. Well, look at that. I got a nice one right there. Looks like negative one. Second graph. Yep, negative one zero. Here it is right here. Now, I don't really need the other two. So I'm not even going to bother going back and look. But remember, in the future, if you don't see it, and we knew that it could go as far out as negative 29 and positive 29, well, then you're probably going to want to change these and take a peek. But for this one, it was the negative 1. So back we go. So the GC graphing calculator gave me the negative 1. And, of course, I'm going to do synthetic with that. So I go back to my polynomial, and I see it is in standard form. So I'll need 1, 11, 39, and 29. And do your synthetic, and let's make sure we all end up in the same place. So that's good. We got a zero in that remainder position. And we have x squared plus 10x plus 29 equals zero. And we know that's not going to be factorable. We know we're going to get imaginary solutions with this one. So let's move the 29 over and out of the way. Do our b over 2 squared. 10 divided by 2 is 5, and 5 squared is 25. So the quantity x plus 5 squared will give us our perfect square trinomial of x squared plus 10x plus 25. And negative 29 plus 25 is going to give us negative 4. And once we take the square root, we go, yeah, that's exactly what we thought was going to happen. But I'm not going to write down the baby step this time. We should recognize that one as 2i. Uh, we've got the square root of 4 and the square root of negative 1. And then we'd subtract 5 from both sides. So we have three zeros. We had negative 1 that we showed algebraically, synthetically, works. And then we have negative 5 plus 2i and negative 5 minus 2i. So f of negative 1 equals 0, f of negative 5 minus 2i equals 0, and f of negative 5 plus 2i equals 0. And for my f of negative 1 equals 0, that one is multiplicity 1, which I'm not going to write down because, like I said, multiplicity starts with 2, and that's not going to be a 2. So um, we would just leave that one as is, knowing that it's going to cross at that point, but not at the imaginaries, of course. f of x equals x to the fifth minus 8x to the fourth plus 28x cubed minus 56x squared plus 64x minus 32. <sighs> Another one that you need a big breath for to get working on. So this one is a degree 5 polynomial. That means five zeros. That means um, best hope would be we only need one, and then it's factorable. Um, Probably the easiest way to do the problem would be if we had three of them that we could work this down synthetically to a quadratic. But we definitely cannot factor that monster. There's no greatest common monomial to work anything out. So in the back we have a 32. One, two, not three, four, not five, and you just kind of run through the numbers in your head. Six, seven, oh yeah, I've got eight and four goes into that. Um, and then 16 and 2 to give me the 32. And in the front, we have a 1. So again, knowing those lets me know if I don't see it from negative 10 to 10, well, it's possible I might need to go as far as negative 32 and plus 32 in order to see that whole thing. Whew. Well, let's take a look at that one.
So go ahead and punch that one in, and you can pause if you need to. x to the fifth minus 8x to the fourth plus 28x cubed minus 56x squared plus 64x minus 32. And you can't see my 2 over there, but it's there. Zoom 6. Oh. Hmm. Well, looks like 2. It also looks like two might count twice because it might be a bouncer there. Second trace. Well, there it is. Two zero. Okay. But I was hoping maybe see three of them. So let's change that window and maybe go negative 35 to 35 because we know the possibles went out to 32. All right. Well, we're going to have to go with the two. So, let's see what happens. All right, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, they're all there. You do your synthetic, I'll do mine, and let's see if we all end up in the same place. So our last line on this one is 1, negative 6, 16, negative 24, and 16. But we got the 0, which is good. So let's see what we have left, which is a lot this time. We have x to the 4th minus 6x to the 3rd plus 16x squared minus 24x plus 16. And that has to equal 0. Well, we can't factor that. One, two, three, four, five terms. Well, remember, when I had that graph up there, I said it could be that at two, we have a tangent. So what we should do is try two again. So go ahead and do your synthetic with your result with a two. Oh, look at that. So it worked twice. And now I think back to what I saw. It could have been a tangent, but it did cross eventually. So maybe it had a multiplicity of three because to cross, it has to be an odd number. So I'm going to try once more with the two. Look at that. So 2 was a repeat 0. In fact, it's a multiplicity of 3. Now, that's as far as it could possibly go for us anyway, because we know if we've got this down to a quadratic, we have to show algebra from here. So remainder constant x, x squared. Well. This does not have a greatest common monomial factor. Uh, might be perfect square trinomial. This is x squared and this is 2 squared. If we take 2 times x and double it, oh, no. And besides, we already know. We couldn't see anymore. There were no more zeros. So this has to be imaginary. So we're going to go ahead and move the 4 over. And... Our little b over 2 will be negative 2 over 2 squared, which is negative 1 squared, which is 1. And that will give us the quantity x minus 1 squared equals negative 3. We can take the square root of both sides. x minus 1 equals plus or minus the square root of 3i, or i square roots of 3. But in standard form, remember the i is always in the back. Um, 
last year they may have had you write it as I square it's of three, but that's because they're worried that people will write it like this and the I looks like it's underneath the radical. We should always put our answers for complex numbers in standard form. So that I should be in the back and you should make sure that you stop your square root before your I occurs. And then we'll add one to both sides. So we have one plus or minus the square root of three I. Now we know that two worked. And that one ended up being a multiplicity of three. Now, you could also zoom box around what happened at that 2, and then you'll see, oh, yeah, it does cross here. And hopefully you'll think, well, if it crosses and there's nothing else I can do, maybe I better try it again because it's got an odd multiplicity. It might cross just the once, but we might see a multiplicity of 3 to cross just the once as well. So the others were imaginary. And so we're not going to even think about multiplicity with those because, again, we know it doesn't cross. It's not going to happen. So lots and lots of zeros here. And this one, I think, has been the most interesting of the problems that we've done because you have to try to think through all the things that you know about the graph and all the things that you know about the numbers. Here's another little whopper. Using complex zeros to factor a polynomial. Given that 6i is a 0 of f of x equals x to the 4th minus 2x cubed plus 38x squared minus 72x plus 72, find the remaining zeros and write it in its linear factorization. Well, if 6i works, I better not forget that negative 6i is supposed to work as well. But can we do synthetic with imaginaries? Yes, we can. And that's what we need to do. So. We have to choose whether or not we want to start that first step with a positive 6i for synthetic or a negative 6i. And here's what we know. The first synthetic step is always the hardest. So if I were you, I would use the positive 6i first because you don't want to try and keep track of a negative on top of doing synthetic with imaginary numbers. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, they're all there. Leave yourself a little bit more space, and I'm reminding myself as I'm reminding you, because we have complex numbers involved here. Alrighty, so let's get started. You bring the 1 down. You multiply by 6i, you get 6i, and then you're not too thrilled to see, oh great, that's going to be negative 2 plus 6i. So off to the side, we're going to show our work for distributing that, and we will get negative 12i plus 36i squared, which of course will be negative 36 minus 12i. 38 minus 36 is 2 minus 12i. Back over here for showing work, and we need to take 6i times the quantity 2 minus 12i. I need some more workspace. That will give me 12i minus 72i squared, but i squared is negative 1. So negative 72 times negative 1 is going to give me positive 72 plus 12i. Well, I like that. Negative 72 plus 72 is 0. I'm going to get 12i. And so the last math I have to do is 6i times 12i, and 6 times 12 is 72, and i times i is i squared, making this a negative 72. Yay! All right, now we know that the second time through with radicals went much easier and this is a complex conjugate just like our radicals were so hopefully this one will go a little bit easier bring down the one multiply ah look at that six i's are going to drop out negative two times negative six i is 12 i oh the i's drop out again two times negative six i is negative 12 i yes Love it. All right, so we've got 
two of the zeros taken care of, 6i and negative 6i. This was a degree 4 polynomial. That means there's two left. Cool. That's a quadratic. We know what to do with that. Remainder, constant, x, x squared. x squared minus 2x plus 2 equals 0. Now, notice we didn't grab a calculator at all for this one. So for this one, we're going kind of blind on this to see whether or not we have something we can factor or not. So there's no greatest common monomial factor. It is not a perfect square trinomial because 2 is not a perfect square. Well, then we'll just have to try two numbers that multiply to 2 and add to negative 2. But that's not happening either. So we're going to have to complete the square. Go ahead and move the 2 out of the way. And then take your little b over 2, negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1, and square it, and that gives you 1. So now we have the quantity x minus 1 squared equals negative 1. And we can see we're going to get imaginaries because our next step is to take the square root. So x minus 1 equals plus or minus i and add the 1 to both sides. So there are the other two zeros and it turns out all of these were imaginary. Now, this had different instructions. It said find the remaining zeros, which we did, and write it in its linear factorization. So let's go make sure it was called f of x, and it was. Um, we had 6i and negative 6i. So x minus 6i and x plus 6i. And then we had x minus 1 minus i and x minus 1 plus i. So the question at this point is always, well, do I have to go farther than that? No. We were just supposed to write the linear factorization. So that is the linear factorization. In fact, that's how we've written linear factorization in the past. All right, next up, this one. And this one will be the most complicated one um, that we're doing today. And how do you know that? We're going to have to do synthetic with that. So you leave, you're going to leave yourself some space with this one. The complex number z equals 1 minus 2i is a 0 of f of x equals 4x to the fourth plus 17x squared plus 14x plus 65. Find the remaining zeros. Well, first things first. If 1 minus 2i is there, 1 plus 2i is also there. So... Again, we're going to do synthetic, and our imaginary, our complex number, it has a real and an imaginary part this time. But again, I start thinking, if I have to do the most math in the first step, I'm going to use the 1 plus 2i, so I don't lose track of any negatives as I go through here. 4, 3, uh-oh, we're going to have to put a 0 in for the third. Second, first, 0. All right, so 4. 0. Oh, I need space. 17, 14, and 65. All right, bring down the 4. 4 times 1 plus 2i. And that one maybe you just do in your head. But always good to show work. And we add. Now comes the fun. Because we're going to take 1 plus 2i times the quantity 4 plus 8i. Woo! All right. Well, that requires foil. First times first is 4. Outside times outside, 8i. Inside times inside, 8 more i. Last times last plus 16i squared. Oh, well, that's going to make that a negative 16. And 4 minus 16 will be negative 12 plus 16i. Combining our two i's together, isn't that fun? Negative 12 plus 16i. 17 minus 12 is 5. And we start over. I need more workroom. 
So I need to know what 1 plus 2i times the quantity 5 plus 16i is. First times first is 5. Outside times outside is plus 16i. Inside times inside is plus 10i. And last times last is plus 32i squared. So that's going to be minus 32. And 5 minus 32 would be negative 27. And 16 and 10i are 26i. Negative 27 plus 26i. Whew. 14 minus 27. Negative 13 plus 26i. Whew. Back over to show my work. The quantity 1 plus 2i times the quantity negative 13 plus 26i. All right. Well, 1 times negative 13 is negative 13. Outside times outside plus 26i. Inside times inside minus 26i. Oh, look at that. The i's are going to be gone. 2i times 26i plus 52i squared, which will make this negative 13 minus 52, which is negative 65. Yay, us! Beautiful! Now, that's the one you want to go super slow through. You want to make sure that you have everything you need. Because again, just like the radicals, the second one is going to go easier. So we're going to use the 1 minus 2i this time. Bring down the 4. Distribute. Well, look at that. 4 plus 4 is 8. 8 times 1 minus 2i. 8 minus 16i. Oh, the i's are gone. Excellent. Multiplying by 13. 13 minus 26i. Oh, beautiful. So what do we have left? Remainder, constant, x, x squared. Now, we have to do the linear factorization, so we have to keep going. And we did not put it in the calculator, so we don't know whether or not these are real or imaginary or whatever. And you could always do the discriminant if, you're, if you really want to spend time on it and find out whether or not it is. Um, or you could go ahead and try and factor it. Um, with this one, you know, we've got a 4 in the front and a 13 in the back. So I would say fastest way would be to check b squared minus 4ac. Use the discriminant. So 8 squared minus 4 times 4 times 13 will give us 64 minus 16 times 13, 208. And 64 minus our 208 is negative 144. Now what does that tell me? It's negative, so that means there are going to be imaginary solutions here. So this is not going to come out as, as something factorable and nice as we work through it. So that means we're going to use completing the square. And I kind of put this right in the middle of everything. I should have put it off to the side, but I have more space down here. So. So this is how... Because it came out, the discriminant came out negative, we know we're going to get imaginary solutions. If it comes out to be positive and a perfect square, that means it's factorable. But negatives, imaginary solutions here. So we're going to go ahead and move the 13 out of the way. And then divide everything by 4. And that, again, is because completing the square requires that your a value is a 1. Then we do our little b over 2 squared. So 2 over 2 squared is 1 squared, which is 1. 
and we get x plus 1, the quantity squared, equals 1 is 4 fourths. So negative 13 fourths plus 4 fourths would be negative 9 fourths. Then we take the square root, and we see that 9 fourths is not such a bad thing. x plus 1 equals plus or minus. That'll be the square root of 9, which is 3, over the square root of 4, which is 2, i. So 3 over 2i. And then subtract 1 from both sides. Whew! Are those ever a couple of monsters there, huh? Negative 1 plus or minus 3 halves i. Gosh, we better go back and read the directions and remember what on earth we were supposed to do with this. Find the remaining zeros. Did that. Did synthetic with a couple of imaginaries, and then we did completing the square. Write it in its linear factorization. Oh, my goodness. So way back up there, we had 1 plus 2i and 1 minus 2i. Um, was it called f of x? I don't want to scroll back up. Yes, it was. It was called f of x. So we have x minus 1 plus 2i x minus 1 minus 2i, and I wrote too big, I hope I can fit these others on here, x minus negative 1 minus 3 halves i, and x minus negative 1 plus 3 halves i. Whew. And again, this was just right the linear factorization. I know I say that, and that sounds so funny. It was just right the linear factorization. But this was kind of a monster problem. And I know I went six minutes over here, but that takes us through um, a very large group of talking about the complex zeros objective. So definitely, day one is something you can do. All right. You will definitely be able to finish day one, and you will be able to go through number 35 on day two. The rest of it you should probably wait until after we finish up day three before you try to do those. So change colors on this. There you are. And that's it. Have a good day.